via the internet. Uh, welcome everybody to the October, uh, pardon my bad typing, that's the October 2014 meeting of the Stamping and Ties Tech Group. October, right? Uh, my name is Eric Com. I am one of the uh, member leaders of the Stamping and Dice Tech Group and the Forming and Fabricating Community of the SME, previously known as Society of Manufacturing Engineers. And you're joining us today for our regularly scheduled monthly meeting of the Stamping and Dice Technical Group. Now, every month we do try to make it a point to spend a portion of our meeting um, either discussing technical topics that might be of interest to people who are in the field of working in stamping dies, and at least twice a year we broaden our scope outside of what many people might say is conventional or traditional stamping applications, and we like to go outside of uh, the stamping sphere and start talking about some other things within forming and fabricating um, at large. Um, we've done so previously with hydroforming. Uh, we've talked about um, non-traditional cutting, uh, welding applications, assembly applications in the past. And today we will be welcoming a guest speaker who's going to speak to us on the topic of stretch forming and uh, give us a little bit more uh, insight into that manufacturing process and um, the types of parts that they make and how they make it and things that you do uh, when you're fabricating sheet metal parts using the stretch forming process. Um, as I said, my name is Eric Kamm. I am the co-chair of the Stamping and Dice Tech Group. Uh, my fellow co-chair is Brianne Roebuck, who is uh, talking to us from Ashtabula, Ohio. Uh, Brianne, can, uh, you want to say hello? Hello there. Um, Brianne's coming to us uh, today as a, uh, as a member and uh, a previous uh, winner of, what did you win? You won a, a few scholarships from SME um, as a student member and, and Brianne has been a very active member in, uh, uh, form, uh, in the forming and fabricating community. Uh, we also have uh, today's special guest speaker is Robert Strasser. Robert's joining us today from Triumph Fabrications, Shelbyville, uh, where he's uh, been joining us in our meetings, and he has tolerated hearing us talk about stamping and dies every month. So this w month, we're going to learn a little bit more about what Bob does at his place. But in the meantime, I do want to discuss some other upcoming events. I'm recycling slides, that's why my typing and my spelling is so bad. Um, upcoming events. Um, everybody, just a quick reminder, don't forget that we're only um, about one month away from FabTech. FabTech this month is going to be in Atlanta, Georgia on November 11th through the 13th at the uh, Georgia World Congress Center or the Atlanta World Congress Center. Um, during FabTech, it is my understanding that um, I will also be delivering a few education sessions. Specifically, mine will be on November 12th. But the entire span of FabTech, the 11th through the 13th, there's a, a full curriculum of stamping, welding, metal fabrication. Um, I believe there's also coatings and chemical treatments, um, educational sessions from all of the different trade organizations that participate in FabTech, and uh, really is a, a wealth of information. So if you go to FabTechExpo.com, you can find out more about the FabTech Expo and see what other educational sessions might be of interest to you. Um, during that same time, November, we will be having a meeting as well as December. And for those of you who are new to uh, this meeting because you got a couple of emails from myself or Brianne, um, this is a reminder that every single month on the second Wednesday of the month, we will be offering, just like we are today, a, uh, our monthly meeting. And we always like to go back and do uh, technical discussions as well as... Um, in stamping and dyes or in other metal forming industries and if you have some technology that you use at your shop 
and uh, some information that you are either willing to share or there's some information that you need and you happen to know somebody who can provide that to us uh, we'll be sure to get those people on the uh, on the platform so that being said that's pretty much my administrative does anybody else know of upcoming stamping and die or industry trade events or educational events that might be useful in the coming months anybody else no okay well I guess at this point I'm gonna turn over control of the presentation um, I'm going to mute all of your microphones during the technical presentation all of your microphones will be muted if there is something that you do need to ask you can use the chat function um, that is accessible on the right hand side of your uh, user interface and that's going to allow you to uh, in essence raise your hand and uh, be able to ask us a question via text via the chat box that you see on the right hand side but at this time I do want to turn over control to Robert Strasser Robert's coming to us from uh, Triumph Fabrications in Shelbyville and Robert is now the presenter uh, let's see shared media files will be closed if I change yes okay there we go all right looks looks like I've got the ball thank you Eric um, as Eric said my name is Robert Strausser I go by Bob um, I am the plant engineer at Triumph Fabrication in Shelbyville we're located in Shelbyville Indiana um, our primary business is uh, stretch forming sheet metal and uh, light structural shapes for the aircraft industry. Uh, and then uh, along with that, we do the uh, value-added operations of trimming out uh, and finishing the components so that they're ready for assembly um, into other sub-assemblies before they're put into the aircraft itself. Um, we have experience in uh, fabricating not only for aircraft, but we've done architectural, automotive, recreational vehicle, uh, heavy truck, and uh, some earth-moving equipment, uh, rollover protection system. Uh, development. So that's the end of my commercial. We'll go ahead and get into the presentation. Uh, I have several slide sets here and I've got to give credit where it's due because of uh, company policies. I cannot share photographs and things of that nature uh, within my facility uh, because of con contractual obligations to our customers. Everybody does the same thing and everybody knows what everybody's doing, but they really don't want us to share it. So um, uh, the Cyril Bath Corporation was gracious enough to share some of their PowerPoint presentations with me. I've modified them. Um, this is not by any means an endorsement of their uh, products. Uh, on the other hand, there are only two major manufacturers in the U.S. that I'm aware of, the other one being Yuri Press. So for what it's worth, um, there's where you can go for machinery. Okay, so what is stretch forming? Well, for, for those of us that can remember what we did with leftovers back before the days of Tupperware, Rubbermaid, and so on, when you had your leftovers at dinner, you'd typically take a piece of aluminum foil, cut it off of the roll, put it over the top of the bowl or the plate, and then wrap it around the edge of the bowl. Now, if you did that by taking your hand and or fingers and grabbing the edge and pulling it, you were actually stretch forming. 
or you were being a metallurgist and proving that uh, what the ultimate strength of aluminum foil is. In a real sense, that is exactly what we do when we stretch form sheet. So stretch forming, by what the slide says here, it's fast, which is a relative term, and it's economical, and it's accurate. And again, these are all relative terms. Uh, machine speeds are not that fast, but uh, it's a lot faster than working the material by hand. Uh, the principal, main principle in stretching is, as I indicated, you pull the material by the edges or by an end of a cross section until you reach the yield point and then move it beyond that as you wrap it around the tool to give it the shape that you ultimately want. Okay, now I gotta forgive me, I'm still trying to get used to this. There we go. Okay. So some of the parts that are made it for the aircraft industry, um, you can see leading edges, fuselage parts, parts with counterforming. That is we're actually getting a re a reverse curve in the part to go with the primary curve, as I'm trying to indicate here. I hope you all can see that. Materials is, can be formed by stretch forming, aluminum, titanium. We've done brass, bronze, stainless steel, galvanized steel, mild steel. Um, if it can be yielded, and you can get some elongation before you hit the ultimate strength. It can be, generally speaking, stretch form. The principal sequence of operation for stretch forming is to load the material into the machine above the die, put a little bit of pre-stretch on it so that you've got it just at the yield point, and then either by moving the grippers down or pushing the die table with the die up, you wrap the material around the form, and then before you release it, you want to give it a little more tug so that the material takes the final set. Okay, so looking at it as an animation, load the material and yeah, I'm still trying to get if this may not work okay here we go then we pre-stretch it wrap it do the post stretch and then you release um, and this is a photograph of a uh, machine with a part uh, being formed. The blue section here is your action is the actual tool uh, sitting on a stationary die table. Um, this particular machine, you grab the material between the grippers and move the gripper assembly down as I hope you can see me moving these arrows or moving the cursor here. There's vertical cylinders here, horizontal cylinders, uh, moving in this direction uh, to move the gripper so that you get your uh, wrap form around the die. Hey, the, Bob, don't forget that if you want to uh, point to something on the screen, you're going to want to uh, activate okay. either that arrow. arrow that arrow thing or the, uh, the laser pointer, which is uh, a drop-down selection uh, below okay. that from the left-hand side. Right, okay. Uh, pencil. Okay, what we've got up here now is a um, diagram or a pictorial of uh, the machine that we were just looking at in the previous slide. You can see that we have the uh, jaw blocks here, or the grippers, is, uh, they're also known as. Um, pair of vertical cylinders on this axis and then horizontal cylinders here. 
it's all mounted on a big frame. Uh, in some cases, machines will have variable length, and the frame, so the frame would be longer, and you'd be able to pin it at various positions uh, within the upper frame. On the grippers, for a typical sheet stretch stretch press, uh, gripper assemblies are pretty much consistent among manufacturers. Uh, you have a hydraulic cylinder, which is in here, pressing down on uh, a jaw plate, which is uh, serrated on the surface that is going to come in contact with the sheet. And then you have another plate here which is stationary. It also has a serrated or a knurled surface uh, to uh, dig into the material a little bit. Um, try not to do it so much that, uh, or use so much pressure that you actually pinch a sheet in half, uh, something you have to consider as you're doing the forming. Um, this particular, uh, Okay, I see, see there are some things here that aren't going to work. But um, that particular style of machine that we were seeing in the previous uh, two slides, you can get them from Searle Bath up to 2,800 tons of force. That'd be pulling force. and um, Or force that could be exerted on your material. Uh, and that translates, you can get the grippers up to... Um, about 18 feet in length, and you can go up to 18 feet between the grippers. So if you could get a rolling mill to produce an 18 by 18 blank, and it wasn't so, uh, and the yield strength on it was below 2,800 tons, you could form up to that size of a part. Um, don't know if you saw it down here, but this particular machine, you can rotate about a horizontal axis or oscillate about a vertical axis, which sometimes comes in handy with, uh, particularly when you need to generate uh, non-rectangular uh, parts um, and use non-rectangular blanks. There's a, just a photo of a uh, completed installation um, believe me, they've come a long way in the 30-some years that I've been in the industry. Uh, this particular machine, you can walk around without having to worry about falling in a pit. Earlier machines uh, did not have that luxury. Uh, again, a layout of what it would take in your NA facility for to in terms of floor space. I know it's all relative. But uh, Cerro Bath likes to put their hydraulic power units in the pit underneath the floor plate. Um, that's a matter of uh, preference. The control panels are relatively simple. I've got a slide later on in a um, swing arm presentation where you can get an idea of what a typical control panel looks like. Um, your electrical cabinet. Uh, for your motor starters and such. And of course, you've got to put this in a pit in the floor. So, And it does, depending on the machine type, it does take a fairly substantial uh, uh, foundation. With the addition of a gantry, which would be traversing outside of the general footprint of the machine, uh, you can put those reverse curves into the part that uh, we were looking at back on, I believe it was like slide one or something. The rever you would use that to put the reverse curve in. Uh, you'd have a male-female uh, die set. You pull your pull the material, and then as you were uh, forming it, you would push down with uh, what we call the bulldozer. So, okay. Are there any questions before I jump into the next presentation, which I think is going to, uh, uh, the one that I'm going to bring up next, Eric, is one on the uh, simulation software. But if anybody's got any questions, that'd be on this part of it, that'd be 
you a good time to ask. <laughs> Any questions for anybody else? Okay. Any other questions from anybody out there? Um, I just unmuted your microphones for a moment. Uh, how does the gantry? How does the gantry portion actually? Does it do any gripping of the material? Or just come down and bump against it? Uh, the well, the gantry is um, it's moved uh, longitudinally along the long axis of the machine by a pair of hydraulic cylinders, and once it gets once it is centered over the die. Uh, there are hydraulic cylinders which uh, be used to uh, exert a force down. So it, it, you can almost think of it in terms of a, a stamping press where you just have the two or a stamping operation or a drawing operation where you just, instead of having a draw ring around the entire blank, you just have uh, the gripper serving as a draw draw ring um, on either on two of the edges. Now, a lot of times we'll design dies so that uh, there is a um, crown of sorts along the edge, so that you can get a little bit of grip there, so that the material um, doesn't slide into the valley as you're starting your initial forming. Um, but as far as actually, as far as the uh, bulldozer um, or the, the the portion of the die pair that is attached to the bulldozer gripping the material, it does not. Okay. It just, um, it just exerts a downward force. Okay, and then I uh, another question came in on the chat window. Of uh, there was a question: Is there uh, nor, uh, a holding or a dwell time at the uh, the end or the bottom of the stretching process commonly? Yes, um, and that can vary. Uh, it, it depends on the on the material being formed and uh, you know how much work hardening has taken place. Um, on these machines, and again, depending on the material, uh, there is a limit on how fast you want to stretch it. Uh, you stretch it too fast and you start uh, causing uh, orange peel and looter lines. Uh, so, yeah, there is a limit on how fast you do it, and, how, and obviously within the... Uh, parameters of the raw material that you're using, uh, how, how much tonnage you, or how much force you would um, apply. But on, on modern machines that have uh, electronic controls, that's fairly easy to uh, program. Uh, I will point out that there are still a large number of uh, machines out here where you will have hand-operated hydraulics controlling your die table and positioning your carriages um, doesn't they're not bad they do a good job in fact if we can get through the presentation uh, the last thing I've got to show you uh, is uh, a video of a part being formed on a machine of that type so Okay, thank you. Thank you for the answers. And um, at this time, I'm going to, again, unmute uh, everyone's microphone except for Bob. And, um, Bob, you can move on to the, uh, the two, three more tabs over where you see Bob's S3F. Uh, right. And that will get you on the right presentation. There we go. Okay, now this is something that uh, I put in. One, because it was given to me by uh, the folks at Cyril Bath, and B, because it tied in, I thought, with um, a presentation that Eric did recently on uh, simulating uh, the stamping process. And I thought it'd be fun to look at it just from the standpoint of seeing uh, what the similarities are in the technology, and uh, it also can sh demonstrate what is happening with the material, I think, um, as we uh, stretch form it. So, um, 
Okay, so the simulating software is an instrument for the technologist or the engineer to design the forming process of sheet metal parts. And it's designed to be or meant to be used by, by the engineering department primarily and then passed directly on to production. Uh, the nice thing about this particular software, if you're using um, a compatible control, you can create the program and download it directly into the controller uh, so that you don't have to develop the process on the machine uh, by trial and error. Okay, there are typically two types of sheet stretch warming um, operations. One is called traverse, where uh, you're pulling the material across the long axis of a die. Uh, this would typically be, you know, think of a leading edge. Uh, we use this type of an operation. Uh, you also have a longitudinal stretch warming. Uh, which is represented by this diagram here. Um, and this would be for a, a fuselage skin. And in fact, that looks a little bit like one that uh, we fabricate here that goes uh, on the fuselage of an aircraft from the windshield back in the uh, forward cabin area. Having trouble hitting a little blue arrow up there. I'm sorry about that. Um, again, these are examples of again of some parts that are made by uh, traverse stretch forming. The ones on the left here would be your traverse, and uh, this one would be your longitudinal. Um, another way of looking at it, uh, typically, although not in all cases, uh, traverse stretch forming you will be stretching the material perpendicular to the direction of rolling. And uh, on the longitudinal stretch forming, you're pulling or you're stretching uh, parallel to the uh, direction of the roll. So the things that you can do with the software are listed here. And let me catch my paper up here with where we are in the presentation. Um, you can check the design of your, of your die and verify that you've got a good position of the die on the, on the work table. Um, you can predict technological failures of the work piece. Uh, it's a reasonable compromise between the complexity and the material cost of manipulating everything by hand at the machine on a, on a trial and error basis versus the cost of having someone sit down and do the programming necessary uh, with the CAD CAM system uh, to develop your tooling and your uh, actual process of forming the part. Um, some presses have specialized equipment. Uh, we talked about the bulldozer earlier. Uh, machines also have the capability of curving their grippers into, uh, we call them smiles or frowns. Um, and there are some systems that will allow you to do S-curves as well. So um, that's, you can program that in to take advantage of it. It speeds up the process and the optimization of the, for the, uh, the CNC press. And you can figure out what your uh, technological parameters are. So the forces, elongations, blank sizes, so on and so forth. So the die design here on the left is not so good. The die design here on the right is better. Again, position on the die table here, uh, this will be a problem. This allows you for a better form. It's not just a die table, but also the positioning of the grippers. Uh, but you can verify all that with the software. Um, some of the things that you could predict by using the software, and believe me, trying to trying to figure these out and fix them when you're doing the trial and error is a real problem. Um, 
how you hold the material, what your blank looks like so that you don't split it here, get it to bunch it, keep it from bunching up in the bottom of the saddle here, as you see the wrinkles, and also overstretching and causing uh, orange peel or in your finished surface. They don't like to see that on the finished skins of airplanes. Um, and then also the spring back, uh, which uh, is always going to be there, but if you can predict what is going to be and make your tooling to accommodate that, it gets you closer to the net finish size that you want. Um, here we see some uh, outputs from uh, the software on different using um, or simulating a, pro, a part. Um, notice that they're going to be pulling on this so much that you're probably going to have an area of uh, failure near the gripper. Uh, here we're seeing uh, where we're likely to see wrinkles in the material uh, because we can't get uniform uh, tension across the entire part of the entire width of the material at the same time. Uh, believe very, I got there's a misspelling in here that should be spring back, but it, you can get uh, graphical and numeric values on what your spring back is going to look like at very por various portions of the uh, sheet there. I think that might be one of those French words, I'm not sure. Okay, demonstrating the complexity and material costs. You can either go with guys out here beating their brains out, uh, trying to figure out how to make this machine produce the part, or you can use the computer to assist you in getting it done the first, done correctly the first time. So the way the software works, obviously, is you put in the data, that being the description of the die and the uh, process data and uh, possibly drawing on some custom material characteristics with the results being the process data uh, which would be the stress and strain forces and a finished part program. Uh, the in input data, okay, a geometric description of the die and Again, much like I believe Eric, the software that Eric was describing in his presentation, you're going to create a mesh on the part, um, which uh, again, you can see the triangular mesh uh, being created on the surface of the die, or yeah, the die in this area, the green part, the green colored section represents the actual finished part. Um, the, they're doing the mesh across the entire upper surface of the die. Um, the one thing about the stretch forming operation, particularly in sheet, is it involves a material blank that is usually substantially larger than what the finished component is going to look like or trim out to be. So then you, in addition, when you need your material parameters, um, yield curves, the parameters, of anastropy, and since I had to look it up, I'll share with you what that is. Uh, it's a property of being directionally dependent as opposed to isotropy which implies identical characteristics or properties in all directions. It's defined as a difference when measured along different axes in the material's physical or mechanical properties. Um, Young's modulus is also known as the tensile modulus or the elastic modulus. And I believe the uh, Poisson coefficient is the same as uh, Poisson's ratio. So, um, and the forming limit, forming limit curve and heat treat map, uh, 
those are things that you develop um, as you're going along. Um, the custom material characteristics, if you want to invest in the, in the equipment to do it, you can actually take a sample of your material, which is uh, the tensile coupon that you see down here at the bottom of the page. Uh, yeah, right there you go. Thank you. I think that's Eric jumping in here. Help me out. Thank you. Um, load that in your... Um, test equipment and you can get the uh, values to plug into the program for the uh, stress strain curve here. And put that into the data. Um, input information about where you're going to put the die, die on the table of the machine, what kind of allowances you're going to have for material um, off of the edge. Uh, information about friction. Uh, Uh, information about the die crest forming coefficient, the wrapping coefficient, post-stretching coefficient, and the initial angle of wrapping. And I'm going to be honest with you, we don't use this software, so I don't really know what those terms mean, but they're values that uh, you would, that will have some bearing on what your final outcome is going to be. Um, it will also indicate where your initial position is, uh, the initial wrapping, the, where the die crest is going to form, the final wrapping and the post stretching. These are all variables that you can control with the uh, machine, whether it be an automatic machine or a manual machine. Uh, you can run it uh, this optimal state that we're looking at here, we're, uh, it's automatic control, but uh, in aluminum, you know, we can run uh, in the O condition, in the uh, W condition, or the S quench condition. So um, one of the benefits is when you do the heat, do that, heat treat to go from a preform to a final form, you gain a lot of your elongation back, and you've actually uh, reduced the yield strength back down, so uh, it makes it easier to form. Uh, you could also say, well, we want to do it in one hit and not have the double machine time on it, uh, so you could run that, per, run that set of variables through using uh, just a one state, and that would be a manual control. Some of the variables that we were talking about, the special circumstances or special features of the machine that you can put in. Um, again, this is similar to the machine that we were looking at in the first presentation, except that um, you can curve the gripper here, which is indicated. Um, this has the repositionable end frame to it. Uh, and the axes are controlled a little bit differently than uh, what the uh, slides in the initial presentation uh, show. So the results that you get out from putting all that information in, you get the process parameters. Um, notice it talk about the blank being either a rectangle or a trapezoid uh, what the forces along the different axes of the, of the material are which be noted down here on both sides the distribution of strains on the surface of the workpiece and again this is I believe this is a saddle piece and this is with the uh, Now she lost my train of thought here. This is, I believe, the saddle piece that we were looking at initially, where, and this is uh, a longitudinally formed part. Um, you can see that the strains are distributed quite differently between the two. 
the distribution of thickness and the surface of the workpiece. Um, when, when the material is stretched, it will uh, diminish in thickness and it will also, in the areas of most stretch, it will, the width of the mater material blank will change. Uh, that's something that's not really noted here, but from experience, we know that that happens as well. Um, okay, we got another slide that we can't show. So, um, looking at uh, a part, if you have it set up for um, optimal or man, you could do manual. This would be the first set of stretch on it do a heat treat, second set, do another heat treat, and then this is what the final or the third set would look like. Can generate messages. This, this one, just for the sake of demonstration, shows that uh, the limit characteristics of the material are being uh, exceeded, so you need to go in and change one of your values to uh, correct that. Again, you can get a graphic representation of the spring back that you're going to get from uh, your tooling. Um, this is a part program in a format that could be recognized by uh, their control. And if it works, yes, we will actually get a simulation here of the part being formed over uh, the tool. Oops, okay, you can um, also pick up on where you might have interference with machine members. Here we see that uh, the gripper is hitting or going to collide with the die table and permits you to make adjustments in your setup before you wreck your machine, which since I get to fix the machines around here, I do not like to see very much. So the current version of the software uh, uses uh, finite element technology, which, again, I believe that's what Eric was talking about in his. Um, you can, you know, previous, it's a improved version of uh, the software in that you can automate the management. Um, you can predict the gap in, in the workpiece clamping jaws and the formation of wrinkles, uh, prepare information for correcting the tool, for spring back, and instead of it being limited in terms of CAD systems that it worked with, they improved the uh, compatibility to include uh, CATIA, which is uh, important to those of us in the air of space industry because some of the large customers dictate that thou shalt use that. Uh, if not, it's at your risk. So. Uh, um, this is just a repetition of what we talked about originally in terms of why you would want to use the software. So um, I think we will move ahead with this. And um, if there, again, I'm not an expert on that software. We don't use it. But if I could shed some light for somebody, I'm willing to take a shot at it. Um, if not, we'll move it. We will move forward into the uh, swing arm presentation. OK. The machine that we have up here on the screen now is uh, a wrap stretch forming machine. And this particular machine has joggling capabilities built onto it. Uh, Typically, this type of a machine is used for extrusion or roll form shape. Uh, if you think about the cabin of an aircraft or a commercial airliner, the structure that uh, holds the, the outer skin uh, in, its con in its circular or elliptical shape uh, are create created on machines of this type. Uh, the key features are you have uh, carriages that hold a tension cylinder with a 
as being the carriage, as being the tension cylinder. The gripper is out here. Okay, the carriage can be moved along the actuating arm back and forth. And the actuating arm is act is moved around a pivot point up in this general area by cylinders here. Um, this particular machine that's illustrated uh, has independent actuating cylinders. Uh, there are machines, uh, smaller machines, typically that would have one cylinder uh, in this area, and they would just have a solid link attached to the arm to do the uh, rotating as the cylinder extended. Uh, the advantage of the type that is set up on the uh, screen here is that uh, you can do other than uh, symmetrical parts. Uh, the machines that have a, a single acting, uh, you're limited. In, if you move 10 degrees on the arms, you're going to get 20 degrees of form. Uh, this particular machine, I could get uh, 110 degrees, where 90 degrees was formed on one side and 20 was formed on the other. Um, joggling can be done on these machines by designing the joggle feature into your tool. As you can, you know, I just went and ran the highlight over it, but in that area there is a joggle. Um, once you would wrap to get that joggle to show up in the finished part, if you just wrapped your material around the die, it would the material would naturally bridge from the high spot on the uh, on the part to out in, in this general area by pressing in with a hydraulic cylinder, which is what this represents. Make one. Especially with a mating form, after you have formed the part, uh, wrapped it entirely around the die, press in with the cylinder, and that puts your uh, joggle into the finished part. Now, not all parts have joggles, obviously, so this is a feature that is uh, designed into the specific tool. Um, so variations on the machine or jaw opening sizes. Uh, I have experience with jaws that are grippers that range from 4 to 24 inches in diameter. Uh, you can have a varying distance between the arm axes. Uh, some machines will allow you actually to change the center of the uh, pivot point as you go through. Um, you can do three-dimensional forming with these machines. And again, my tip of the hat to Cyril Bath, they offer machines with uh, maximum distance between jaws ranging from uh, 177 to 444 inches, in spite of my saying that on that last one that it was feet. This is an example of a, a three-axis or a three-dimensional uh, machine, again, looking or remembering what the uh, original machine looked like, uh, being just a straight T with the carriages that moved uh, back and forth with the tension cylinder in there. Oops, one, too, too many. Okay, they've added a framework on the carriage that allows the tension cylinder to be moved in the z-axis and that would have to be that would be programmed in so that as if you were actually doing the forming by moving the actuating cylinder uh, the tension cylinder could be raised um, I'm told that this particular machine was uh, built to uh, put windows into the hull of a boat and they wanted to uh, form it to the contour of the hull as they were stretching the material. I have a different view there. The same machine and 
this is the control panel. As you can see, it's relatively simple. Um, there's some joysticks for moving the various axes, uh, motor start-stop switch, uh, switches to uh, actuate the various portions of the machine forming cycle, uh, keyboard for making entries, or modifying the program, um, not a whole lot of space uh, required for that particular console. Um, it's a machine that I'm familiar with. We have one of these in the plant. It's a Hufford, which is uh, now made by uh, Erie Press, um, or at least they own the brand name and uh, presumably all the design information that goes with it. This particular machine is a 150-ton machine. Um, has uh, curvable grippers. Uh, you can oscillate plus or minus 10 degrees here. Uh, gripper structure can be rotated up to, well, from 0 to 90 degrees in 15 degree increments. Uh, this machine can also accommodate a extrusion gripper in this general area. Uh, which would allow you to not just form sheet on this machine, but also uh, extrusion to our roll form shapes, uh, I-beams, angles, channels, things of that nature uh, that required a higher tonnage. Your tooling would be mounted on uh, this platen, which is positionable um, about uh, an axis uh, perpendicular or yeah, perpendicular to this surface right here. Um, again, you can get 180 degrees of f up to 180 degrees of form out of this machine. Uh, each set of actuating cylinders, which uh, here and here, uh, being independent, so that you can swing the arms. Uh, similar to what you saw before, I put all those lovely red lines up there. Uh, two different angles. Uh, a view showing some of the options that are available. Uh, you can have it arranged so that your gripper rotates as you stretch. Uh, this could be handy if you wanted something uh, a square section or a section with a flat across this area of your tooling. And as you went around, you wanted to put a twist in it. Um, direct clamping jaws would be what we saw when we were talking about the sheet press originally, uh, where a hydraulic cylinder pushes against, pushes a serrated plate against another serrated plate. Um, you can cross, have cross slide on the carriage, which allows you to do a smaller tool, put a smaller tool, but still be able to get the full 180 degrees of form out of the tool um, inside the pivot points of the arms, these being the uh, center of the pivot for the actuating arms. Uh, you can equip it with load cells and uh, in some cases, uh, you may want to pro clamp the profile as you're forming the part uh, to manipulate uh, various features. So those are all things that you can put have incorporated into the machine. Typical extrusion gripper, which this is a photograph or set it, this photograph I came across uh, off of a Hufford stretch forming uh, machine. This is probably in the range of an 8 or a 10 inch gripper. You have uh, moving inserts, which in this case I believe there are three, this being one, this being one, and this being one, that uh, match the profile of the material that you're going to form, which uh, it'll show up better on the next slide, but that'll be about the profile that is being formed with this particular gripper. Uh, the 
outer diameter of the gripper is actually uh, conical in uh, shape with the gripper housing being conical on the ID as well. A cylinder is attached in a free-floating form to these gripper segments so that as that cylinder is actuated within the housing, the segments move uh, perpendicular to what we, to the, uh, are they parallel to the axis of uh, the tension cylinder. So that as, it, as the segments are pulled back, they open, and as they're pushed towards us as we're looking at this, they close. Um, looking at the next slide here, you can see the actual cross-section of uh, this aluminum part, how it's uh, made it up in the gripper. You can also see that the gripper is recessed a little bit because the material has uh, taken up some of the space, which kept the gripper from coming all the way out to the uh, front of the housing here. Uh, this particular part is flat, is a uh, wide view shape similar to what you'd see on the front of a uh, dump trailer. So, um, okay, okay, other things that you can do. Uh, this particular tool is set up so that as the part is being formed or after being formed. It has uh, flip over drill jigs so that you can put tooling holes in it. Uh, things of that nature are done commonly. Uh, certainly speeds up the process and assembly or locating on uh, fixture on uh, assembly or trim fixtures as you go forward in the operations. Okay, so I believe that that's the last slide in this set. Um, any questions from the field here? I guess one of the things that I probably should have said long, long time ago, uh, when we talk about uh, the forming strength or the forming of the material and what kind of forces it takes to do it, um, the typical formula that is used is to take the cross-sectional area, multiply it by the minimum yield strength, and then add a variable for friction and uh, what you might possibly uh, gain in work hardening strength. So cross-sectional area times uh, your yield, yield strength of the material plus 25% is a general rule of thumb uh, that we've used here for a long time in determining how much force is required to manipulate or stretch form the material, whether it be sheet or extrusion or you know, struct general structural shape. So. All right, uh, Bob, a couple of questions came in on the chat line. I'm reading them right now. Sure. Um, one of the questions was, uh, for stretch forming, do we typically or usually use lubricant in the process? Yes. Um, and those, that that is a whole other subject. Um, they, we have used, and this is in, in, in accordance, believe it or not, with uh, customer specifications specifications, animal fat, vegetable oil, uh, mineral and synthetic oils. Um, in fact, if you look at the slide that's up there now, you see some, uh, if you look along the edge here, you see some drippings of a white uh, paste type lubricant that's uh, been wiped off of the part. Uh, generally, it would be applied uh, to the tool um, again, if we get to see the uh, last uh, movie or video clip that I've got, get a, a view of how that is applied. Okay, thank you. Um, another good, good question. Another question that came in is uh, when it came to that simulation software. Um, in there, okay. we mentioned the uh, the tool kinematics and such. And a question uh -huh. was asked is. Uh, 
is that information uh, fed the, the tool kinematics, does that something that somebody has to key in manually, or is that um, uh, information transferable to the software directly via the machine CNC or the machine controls? I believe that that, um, again, I'm not an expert, but I believe that that's going to be something that is keyed in once and then stored in a file. Okay, thank you. And um, you mentioned the uh, the one machine maker here in the U.S. as Erie Press. Uh, is that in Erie, Pennsylvania? <laughs> I believe that is correct. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the 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 uh, by way of explanation, there have been a number of machine builders in the U.S. Uh, you heard me mention Hufford, uh, Sheridan. Sheridan Gray, uh, I believe there was a company known as Airco, E-R-C-O. They made uh, sheet forming machines. Uh, Moust, M-A-U-S-T, they also made machines. Uh, as the industry consolidated, a lot of those companies were bought by LNF Industries, um, which was in California. And not too long ago, they were purchased by Erie Press. So, um, and I know that Erie Press is currently manufacturing the swing arm machines, and I've seen some, uh, I believe I've seen some literature that leads me to believe they're also doing the sheet forming machines as well. But uh, Erie Press and Cyril Beth are the two companies that I know of in the United States that are producing this type of equipment there could be more and you know I, like I said it's not really an, it's not an endorsement of anybody um, it's just what I know and can can, can relate to you okay um, and um, I just took over the uh, presenter ball quickly um, okay. I was going to load up those videos that you mentioned and then also uh, read off one of those last questions um, okay Right, was there, Go for it. Okay, um, so one of the questions came up. Somebody asked, uh, why would stretch forming be chosen over roll forming? And while you're formulating that answer, I have a, the, uh, the video that you sent along of that stretch forming process. Okay, that's fine. Well, interesting that you should ask about the ro comparing it with roll forming. Um, there was a project we were involved in uh, several years ago that involved the uh, renovation of the Guggenheim Museum in New York. Uh, when Frank Lloyd Wright originally designed that building, uh, there were some uh, multi-axis, for lack of a better word, convex or concave sheet metal parts that he wanted to incorporate into the building, um, but he couldn't find anybody to fabricate the parts. It was beyond the scope of what people could do by hand uh, with, and get the quality that he was expecting. Uh, when they did the renovation, um, somehow or the other, we became involved in it. The architect saw some aircraft skin parts and thought, well, that looks similar to what we're looking for here, uh, came to us and we were able to uh, fabricate tooling to produce the parts. So roll farming works, yes. Um, sometimes it, and sometimes it's a, a good answer uh, to producing what you, what you need to produce. Um, but particularly where you don't have a constant uh, radius. Um, I think that, you know, from my experience with the roll forming anyway, uh, stretch forming is a lot more practical. Uh, when you look at trying to do a, a uh, do roll forming with a, or do roll forming on a leading edge, stretch forming is a lot faster. Okay. All right, and you can, now can we back this? Yeah, we can back this up. Or would you just uh, yeah, let's back this up. 
Um, this this is a video I found on uh, YouTube that uh, interested me. Again, and this is a company in England that's producing uh, this part for. Um, and the red section there, I don't know if you got to see it while it flashed up there. It is leading edge, and it has a change in direction along the actual leading edge. So we have a saddle type. Yeah. Let's yeah, see. Yeah. Right where the buffering box came up. Yep. It was right, right at that point. So here you see the... Uh, blank being has been loaded in the machine. You can see that we're starting to get a little deformation on the end where the material is rolling over the end of the die. But you can also see out here in the center the reflection of the light, how the excess material is starting to buckle as uh, they push the tool upward. And as the material flows over the die, and it does look like it's flowing. Um, the buckle slowly diminishes. You can also see somewhat here that on the end of the die, the material has been pulled and folded over the end of the die. Um, some of the operations they were going through there were actually installing mechanical clamps to hold the material in place. Now, this is a heat treating process. If they're doing what I think they're doing, they're putting that preformed part into a furnace that is somewhere around 850 to 900 degrees Fahrenheit. And it'll soak there per a recipe, uh, dependent upon the alloy and the thickness for some period of time, which is why it's uh, sometime later. Now, the equipment that we use, you don't do that with. Uh, we load <laughs> the material onto a rack and we load it in into a furnace by way of an elevator. Uh, yeah, that would be an annealing so, okay. oven. Um, essentially taking that uh, work hardened material, uh, very likely uh, some aluminum uh, material or aluminum alloy, yeah. and then um, the material's been work hardened in that first forming operation, and when they put yep. it in that furnace, they're restoring the material's work hardened grain structure back to something similar to what it was when it came off of the uh, the initial uh, mill line. Right. And that way, the material okay. gains back some extra extra formability. Yes, it does, which is very important. And actually, we would call this a solution furnace because once we get past the sometime later, the sometime later is running quite long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you at in your video? Because my I just finished. The, um, the video must be okay, buffering was, differently for everyone. Yeah, okay. Well, if, if you saw it come out of the... Okay, I went from some time later straight to the end, end, yep. of, the, end of the movie. Yeah, it was um, buffering issues. So, um, yeah, a, after okay. it comes out of that furnace, it gets back loaded back into the exact same stretch forming machine, and they they just seem well, to drive that ramp. It goes through a ramp. quench operation. Yep. Yeah, goes through a quench operation first which is why I say that was a solution. If it had just been annealed, it would still it would be back to the O condition, but it went to the AQ condition, um, which means that it can work hard now. Okay, at this point, there they go. They're, I think they're getting ready to put the lubricant on the die for the final form. Yep. And you'll see that it's a white paste, and it's, either, it's being brushed, wiped on. There you go. Reload the part, put the final tug on it, and call it a day. So again, you can if you're if you want to see this, uh, see the video complete with the uh, wonderful soundtrack. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. Um, yep. And again, this was this is work done by Beagle Technology Group. Uh, they're in England. But again, it was a vi it's a video that I thought showed what some, what the process is like in real life. So, 
again. Uh, okay, so then I know we... we're running a little bit long. Do you want to look at the tooling aspect of it, or do we want to save that for another day? Or did I put the same video? That would in be tools? Bob's. That would be no. That's Bob's presentation. Okay. Yep. We can uh, stop that okay, video. Okay. This is okay. Here's another. This is another stretch forming uh, simulation. This runs real quick. Um, again, this is another uh, serial bath machine. Notice that the material has been gripped. The grippers are rolling into the frown position. The die table is advancing the tool into the material as the material is being uh, pulled longitudinally. Um, there's the finished part. Remember I said there was an awful lot of excess material on these parts as they're formed, and that's where that particular part goes on the airplane. Okay, um, I'm okay. going to give you back, I'm going to put it back on Bob's presentation and okay. give you back the ball. Very good. Uh, for those of you who, uh, again, as uh, Bob mentioned, those videos just came off of YouTube, um, um, I put the link to the uh, the longer video already in the chat box window so you can go ahead and uh, grab that link and uh, take a look at it yourself and uh, Bob I, you have the ball so you can uh, do your last few okay. two slides okay um, looking at and I should have pointed this out when we were looking at the swing arm machine it's, the tooling for a swing arm machine is typically stacked plates uh, that have been cut to the profile for the uh, inside mold line of the part that you want to create. Um, on a stretch form tool, there's a myriad of ways that uh, this is done um, and materials that it can be made out of. Uh, what I've done here is drawn up a, a simple die that's uh, about a 20 inch radius, 60 inches long, uh, 180 degrees. Uh, using a technique that has been used for uh, ages, which is to do a uh, fiberglass reinforced polyester shell, which is the blue, and to bond it to a uh, steel grid or support structure. So if we look at this in cross-section, you can see the inside of the shell and uh, the steel grid that would actually support it. Um, other techniques are used to uh, replace the steel grid. Uh, I've seen tooling where the grid was eliminated and the die was, uh, the outer section was made up of steel plate and in some cases uh, FRP. And then the void would be filled with concrete. A steel plate with uh, J bolts on it would be set on the edge of the frame down here and that would create the tool. Um, blue dot. Uh, this is one example of work that is done in my shop. It was done in my shop that I can show you because uh, somebody wrote an article about it that's been published. But this is a Kirk site leading edge die being probed on a five axis machine. Um, it's notice that it's you know long narrow. And Eric, your favorite question, what is Kirksite? Kirksite is a zinc alloy. And I won't give you the rest of the details on that in the interest of time. Uh, you can, dies can be made out of uh, cast iron. Again, here you see what we could, would call a flip over dotter. Uh, the pivot point back here. Do it on this side. Maybe. And there's just a little transfer screw right here that when you flip it over, you get an indentation in your in the material, which would be a guide for uh, locating the stretch form part on uh, your holding fixture for uh, subsequent operations. Uh, we talked a little bit about the reinforced uh, fiberglass. Um, Again, this is one that I believe was done with uh, either concrete, uh, fill. Uh, believe it or not, we've actually done it with uh, crushed walnut shells in, uh, poly or in uh, polymer 
as a fill to reinforce the outer shell. Uh, another technique that has been used is uh, rolling a thick steel plate to the general profile, supporting it with a rib structure, and uh, putting it up on a five-axis or yeah, five-axis machine tool and uh, cutting the final uh, shape for the inside mold line onto the uh, steel plate. Um, it's tricky to do, but if you miss your form a little bit, we could end up machining through the steel, and then you're back to square zero. So, um, okay, and that's where we had the uh, videos at. So, any other questions? I know I ran a little bit long here, and I know it was very general. If there are specific areas that would be of interest further down the line, I'd be happy to try and put something else together. Um, any other questions? Hey, what's, I, uh, what's roughly the cost of a piece of equipment like this in this picture? Okay, which picture were... Um, what's on the screen? Okay, I don't... I'm sorry, I don't have anything on my screen right now. <laughs> this is the one that had the video of the stretching the, the skin. Okay, the the the, uh, uh, the leading edge. Uh, th that machine you're going to find on the used market right now. Um, I can tell you that uh, in if you look at the uh, simulation that uh, uh, was the second video. Uh, the foundation for a machine of that size where you had two inch, 200 inches by uh, 144, the foundation alone is about one and a half million. And the machine's going to be at least half of that. So the foundation is more than the machine? Yep. You said two and a half million? By yeah. Do you have made for the foundation and cost more or that? Yeah, foundation costs more than the machine. Yep. Yeah, because it just all, yeah. and put stuff under no, when, it. When, when you consider that, you know, the, the forces that are being generated, um, when granted they're going to eat, well, the forces that are being generated when you uh, form that material, uh, in the case of uh, the machine that we were looking at there that had uh, three die tables on it, so that, that thing could generate, you know, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,500 to 2,000 tons of upward thrust on the die table. You start putting, transferring that into the other members, and it it takes a heck of a heck of a mass to hold that in place. One thing I can tell you is when, when you turn those machines into tensile testers instead of stretch warming machines, people will jump. It gets loud. Yeah, yeah it'd be a huge bang. Because, I, I mean, even yep. just tiny yeah. dog bone tests, you have quite a snap. I'd say this is definitely a far cry and much more sophisticated than the little than forming the little heated plastic parts in lat in uh, in shop class. Yeah, I think maybe a little bit, yes. <laughs> oh, but the that type of forming was quite fun. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, what if there are there no other questions? I'll turn it back over to you, Eric. I, I got one. I, I've got one. Um, okay, go ahead. Speaking of plastic, I know the newest thing is, is uh, like graphite fiber. Uh, you know, maybe graphene. using it and graphene. Using uh, talking about using that in aircraft skins. Is there anything being done with this where they're heating and stretching polymers to shape? Not that I am aware of. Okay. Just, um, I, just, I think uh, most of that 
you know, uh, they're using what I'm familiar with. They're using uh, automated layup equipment to lay down the, the uh, uh, fibers with the binder, and then going into autoclaves to uh, heat the material and set it. Okay. Thank you. Um, what other questions? Any other questions for uh, for Bob or uh, observations regarding the uh, the stretch farming process? I have a question. Um, does does the material have to be a certain thickness, or could it be just like any thickness? The, ma the material. Uh, the thickness, there is no set thickness. Okay. okay. The, the, big, the big thing that you, that you have to be concerned about um, is uh, the, the, uh, depending upon the part that you're trying to fabricate, uh, do you have enough elongation in the material um, and Again, going back to what I talked throughout there briefly towards the end is to a basic formula for knowing how much force it would take to uh, elongate that material. It's a cross-sectional area. So if you've got a sheet of material that's 48 inches wide uh, you know, by an eighth of an inch thick and, and you want to form that, Take the 48 times 0.125 times the yield strength, and then add 25% for friction and uh, strength gains or work hardening. And I would tell you if you can, if you have a chance of stretching it to a general form. Uh, when you start getting into complicated forms, then there are other factors that come into play. But uh, you know, we we've done. I think we've done some uh, stainless steel leading edges that were in the 20 or 30 thousandths of an inch range. Um, so. Right. So. Okay. Um, right. Uh, so you know, more limiting than absolute thickness, as Bob was mentioning, is that uh, you. Uh, you want to know what those forces are, right? And the for uh, what he mentioned that formula. The the basic thing you need to know is that anytime you want the stretch forming to work, you're taking some sort of sheet or plate of material. You're trying to deform it beyond its yield strength because the whole idea is to work it beyond its elastic region of behavior and plastically and permanently deform it. So you have to exceed its yield That's strength. That's correct. So the minimum amount of force yep. that you would ever apply if your yield strength equals your force over uh, force divided by the unit area, right? That's the normal way that we think about how one computes the yield stress. The uh, force that you apply at the time of permanent deformation or plastic deformation divided by the cross-sectional area. Therefore, you could say that the minimum amount of force you need is your material's yield strength times that cross-sectional area. Yep. Right, so... Uh, That's right. Based on the type of uh, shape you're forming, you cut a section through that, you figure out what that cross-sectional area is or the mass moment of inertia. You multiply that times your yield strength, and that gets you your minimum force. So the thicker the material gets, the uh, greater the amount of force that you would have to apply. Similarly, um, the stronger the material is, the more force you have to apply. Exactly. Yeah, and one of the things that occurred to me when uh, you were showing that... Um, that leading edge, edge example, right? And it has that complicated shape. The um, I'm going to call it the Pringles chip shape, right? The hyperbolic paraboloid. Um, and, yes. Okay. Right? And the question was, well, you know, how? Why is it better than, or why would you use it instead of roll forming, right? Um, roll forming is something you usually do when you are trying to create a a product that has a repeatable cross section. Um, some sort of uh, 
Yes. Continuous cross cross section, you know, a hat shaped rail, a uh, an L shaped rail, a, bo- a closed box section, right? Tubes are made by roll forming, right? And what you're looking for yes. is that consistent cross section. When you take a look at a hyperbolic paraboloid, or imagine slicing a cross section through your Pringles chip, um, it's not easy to find uh, a repeatable cross section through your Pringle. Right, regardless how you slice it, exactly. you yeah. would you would find some curvature change from section to section across its length, and that's where you see right. methodologies like stretch forming or um, uh, incremental uh, forming or sheet metal stamping. Uh, that's where these types of processes are preferred over roll forming when you don't necessarily have that repeatable, um, consistent cross section. Right, but and I think too, there you got to be careful when you say roll forming. There's roll forming like we talked about a couple of months ago, mm-hmm. and then there's roll forming where you had the pyramid roll. Oh, um, if yep. you look at that, if you look at that Evro, uh, where if you, the video that actually shows the, the stretch forming process in the background of that, uh, I believe is a for, uh, Farnham leading edge roll. Okay. Um, and you could use that, but again, when you have those varying cross sections where you have the great and where you're not following a straight line, that, that, that process just doesn't cut it when you want to make the sharp transition. So, Okay. Well, thank you very much, Bob, for uh, taking us through... Uh, an introduction into uh, the, the technology and the manufacturing process you work with every day at uh, at Triumph. And uh, with that, I think we are uh, pretty much to the end of our time allotment today. Thank you again for taking the time to present. Thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your day to participate in, uh, again, this monthly meeting. Okay. Thanks it again, Bob. It was a Bob. pleasure. Thank you very much. It's been fun. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. Thank you again, Bob.